Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's Code Presents webinar. We're glad you could join us. Today's event will focus on the options available for building installation packages for your Windows desktop applications. My name is Jim Duffy, and I'm here to get things started and introduce today's presenter. If this is your first time attending one of our webinars, welcome. If you've attended our webinars in the past, welcome back. Code Magazine is a leading software development magazine written by developers for developers. As a benefit for attending today, all registered attendees will automatically receive a free Code Magazine subscription, provided you don't already subscribe based on the email you're registered with. I've also included a free subscription link here to share with your coder friends, associates, colleagues, team lead, CTO, social media followers, your enemies, your arch nemesis, and so on. Code Consulting's continuing mission is to help people build better software. We build custom solutions, we modernize legacy applications, and support, maintain, and or enhance exist existing applications that aren't candidates for modernization. Whether it's cloud-based or on-prem, a web application, a mobile app, or a Windows desktop application, we can help with whatever platform you're targeting. Our team of expert developers and consultants are ready to help with your next project. Our very popular and in-demand free hour of code provides an opportunity for you and your team to meet with our hand-picked team of experts to ask any questions you have, or brainstorm architectural ideas, or talk about JavaScript frameworks, or discuss cloud strategies, best practices, or whatever else you want to pick our brain on. No charge, no strings, no commitment, and no credit card. Just free help from our code experts. Slots are limited, so reach out to me about getting your free hour of code scheduled. If you like what you see today or have seen in our prior webinars, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. We would like your feedback about this webinar in the form of a really quick survey, and we're willing to $100 in the form of an Amazon e-card to one lucky attendee. A name will be drawn from the entire webinar's registered attendee list, and a completed survey is required to qualify for the e-card. If the selected name hasn't completed a survey, another name will be selected, and so on. I know you don't want to be the person whose name is selected only to lose out because you failed to complete a survey, right? Right? The survey is very short and you'll finish it in no time flat. The survey link is on the slide and we'll post the survey link in the chat window as well. Today's webinar is being recorded and the video and slides will be available on the Code Presents page. Our presenter today is Jeff Callahan. Jeff is one of our senior software developers and has also written for Code Magazine. Jeff has worked on projects that include debugging legacy code on integrated circuits in industrial applications to creating modern desktop and web applications. He specializes in C-sharp and .NET, WPF, WCF, ASP.NET MVC, React, Vue, JavaScript, and Azure. When he's not writing code, Jeff is an avid reader, amateur musician, and a bewildered gardener. Take it away, Jeff. Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. As Jim mentioned, my name is Jeff Callahan, and I'm here to give you a brief overview of the various methods of getting your desktop application onto other people's machines. There are a lot of ways to accomplish this task. The tools I will be discussing have a lot of paths you can follow and options you can implement in a multitude of scenarios. Installations can be built directly through Visual Studio, or they can be built from the command line. They can be one-time deployments or deployments that update themselves automatically or even deployments that take advantage of continuous integration and continuous deployment. This is too much information for a one-hour presentation. And in any case, most developers will likely pick one method that suits their particular scenario and stick with it until there's a need to change. I'll be focusing exclusively on publishing deployments through Visual Studio as this is probably the most common method and certainly is the easiest to demonstrate. Keep in mind that anything I'll be showing you can likely be scripted for the command line if necessary. I'll start with a description and demonstration of the simplest method of deploying a desktop application from a Visual Studio solution. Then I'll discuss a more specific case, single file applications that has been gaining in popularity. Following that, I'll move on to an old favorite, click once, and then I'll dig into the newest and most powerful option, MSIX. Throughout my presentation, I'll be laying out the pros and cons of each option, which I hope will help you determine which option is appropriate for your scenario. I always like to start with a brief history lesson. 
I've been developing desktop applications for a long time. One of the greatest benefits of the explosion of the web is that installations are not necessary for web apps because, as my first bullet point reminds us, installations have never been fun. Theoretically, developers would build the application, get it to work, and then hand it off to an ops group who would package it for release. For a very simple application with few dependencies, this is usually pretty easy. Quite often, however, the application would immediately fail once it was installed for any number of reasons. We've all heard the old trope, it works on my machine, and many of us recall DLL hell. Of course, the reason it works on the developer's machine is that the developer has all the necessary libraries and tools and runtimes required to make the application work. At this point, the development and ops teams would have to work together to figure out what's missing and then figure out how to add it to the installation. I myself have generally worked in smaller shops where there was no ops team, so the responsibility was usually mine. I suspect this is a very common scenario. Using tools like Install Shield, my team would develop the application and then I would build the installation. I tested in as many scenarios as I could feasibly arrange and then it was somewhat up to fate. I must have good karma because it usually worked out reasonably well. With the advent of the DevOps concept, the line between the two groups has become very blurry. This is more or less just how things work now. We're all part of one big team, and it's quite likely that the group that develops the application will also be heavily involved in, if not completely responsible for, the installation. As a young developer, a depressingly long time ago, I developed applications exclusively for Windows machines with a limited number of possible screen sizes. There was no expectation that the application would need to run on mobile devices or on Mac OS or Linux. The data was most likely either local or contained on an internal network, so security considerations were minimal. And in any case, not my problem. The network team handled all that. I also had a lot more hair. I can't prove that creating installations is responsible for my current hairline, but it can't be ruled out. In the modern world, Installations have to consider many more variables. Modern installations have to account for all of these things if they're going to prove useful. Depending on the target audience, the application may need to be installed on multiple operating systems, including mobile devices. Security considerations are paramount. Desktop applications generally must be digitally signed so that operating systems can trust them, which protects against things like viruses and ransomware. Users no longer expect to have to be involved in the update of the application. Those updates should be automatic and as silent as possible. In short, users have very high expectations of flexibility, security, and convenience in the modern era. Let's get down to some specifics. I'm going to demonstrate how to publish a desktop application directly through Visual Studio. This is actually quite simple, but there are a few options that you should be aware of. These two options are self-contained and framework dependent. I'll explain the main differences, but there are a lot of ramifications to this decision, so it's worth doing a little research on your own. Self-contained deployments, as you might expect, include everything the application needs in order to run. This includes the required .NET runtime. Self-contained installations are platform specific. The .NET runtime included in the installation will determine the operating system on which the application can run. You can select Windows, Mac, or Linux, but the application will only run on the chosen platform. Self-contained deployments also have the option of ready-to-run compilation, which is a form of ahead-of-time compilation. This option can improve startup time. However, the impact is difficult to predict. The files will be much larger, which can actually cause a decrease in performance. The best use case for this option is applications that contain large amounts of code. Framework dependent installations, on the other hand, are cross-platform. The installation itself will not include any .NET runtime, just the application and any third-party dependencies. The installation will therefore be much smaller. The drawback here is that the application will not run on any operating system until the appropriate .NET runtime has been installed. So let's dig in and see how this is done. I'm going to switch over to Visual Studio now. I have a simple WPF app 
the ubiquitous uh, Hello World. So I'm just going to run it so you can see what we're going to be installing. And here it is. So now we want to get this wonderful application onto somebody else's machine. Let's say that our initial customer base for this application is strictly Windows. We can create a self-contained installation for this scenario. Going to our Solution Explorer, if we right-click on the project, we'll see a Publish option. We'll select a folder as we're simply going to publish to our local machine. And you'll have to select Folder twice. Then we'll put a target folder, which is where the installation is going to go. Now that we have our installation created, if we click on Show All, we'll see various options. Since we're trying to create a self-contained deployment, we'll choose Self-Contained here. And we'll just choose Win64. You can see that you also have some other options such as OSX and Linux, but we're just going to publish to this local machine to make sure that everything works right. Now we're just going to save and we're ready to publish. Now that Publish has succeeded, we'll run to that target folder, and you'll see that there's some files here. There's actually quite a lot of them. Distribution would likely involve zipping up these files somehow. But these files are all you need to have a running application on a 64-bit Windows machine. And we can prove that just by dropping to the bottom here and running the app. And there we are. Hello, world. If your user base expands to other technologies, you might want to create a framework-dependent installation. Rather than change the one we've already created, let's build a new one by clicking New over here. Again, we'll select Folder and select it again. And we'll put in our target directory. And then we'll click Show All to look at our options. Framework dependent is the default and portable is for cross platform. So all we need to do here is save and publish. Now if we jump over to that folder, you'll see we have a lot fewer files here. I already have the .NET runtime installed, so I can just run the EXE. If we were trying to run this application on, for example, Ubuntu, we would have to copy these files over to the Ubuntu machine and then pre-install the required .NET runtime before this application would actually work. Another option you have at this point is a single file application, which is really just a subset of the self-contained application. Using this option, you can compile the entire application into one file. This option has been around for quite some time, since uh, .NET 2.1. A significant change in .NET 5, in my opinion, is that this option does not actually combine, combine all the files into one by default. There are actually several flags that are not included in the UI. One of these flags, include all content for self-extract, is needed in order to truly have a single file. So let's create one more installation to demonstrate this. We'll click New again, and once again, choose Folder twice, and set our target folder. So now we'll choose Self-Contained, and this time we'll look down here at the File Publish options. 
you'll see this first option, Produce Single File. You'll also notice the Enable Ready to Run compilation, which I mentioned earlier, and the Trim Unused Assemblies, which is not uh, in production yet, it's still in preview, so I won't be demonstrating that. But now that we've set Produce Single File, we can simply hit Save and Publish one more time. And now we'll navigate to that folder. Oh, wrong folder. And you'll see here, as I mentioned, that there are actually quite a few files in here. The application does run as normal. But if you truly want to make this a single file application, what you end up having to do is drill into your published profiles. Our latest profile is called Folder Profile 2. And if you open this up, you'll see that it's just XML. To get all of these files compiled into truly one file, we do just have to add one tag here. Include all content for self-extract and set it to true. Now, if I go back here and publish one more time, And now that the publish has succeeded, you'll see that we only have the exe file and the pdb file, and you only need the exe file. The reason for this are quite technical, but basically it's apparently quite difficult to load native libraries directly from the exe. Therefore, by default, some of those native libraries are left outside the executable. As with the other deployment methods, there certainly are other options you can use, so it's worth doing some research before choosing this method. The next tool I'd like to discuss is ClickOnce. ClickOnce installations have been around for quite some time. There are some excellent Code Magazine articles about ClickOnce from as far back as 2006. There haven't been a lot of significant changes, so much of this information is still useful. MSIX, which we'll discuss later, may at some point make ClickOnce obsolete, but for now, ClickOnce is still being updated and maintained. The process for creating the installation is relatively simple once you get used to it, and once the installation is set up, keeping it up to date is trivial. The prior examples were merely a way of packaging your application. In most scenarios, that's not sufficient, and further steps would need to be taken to make the application available to users. ClickOnce is a much more fully featured installation experience. ClickOnce installations can be created to install from a UNC file path, such as a network drive, or from a CD or DVD or a USB drive, or from a website. Installing from a website is probably the go-to method these days, so that's what I'll be demonstrating. You can set your installation to look for updates automatically in the given location. When the application runs, it will look in that location for any new updates and after prompting the user, the new updates will be installed. Each new update will increment the version number of the application. New updates can also be installed by navigating to the installation page and simply running the installation again. ClickOnce also has an API that can be used to manage more complex scenarios. For example, what if the initial installation is behind some kind of firewall or paywall? You don't want your user to have to log into your site every time there's an update. The API can handle the update process from within code and potentially grab the updates from a different location. I actually use ClickOnce quite a lot. It covers all of the bases for most applications. All I need to do is create a web app in Azure as my hosting location, set up my installation to publish both the original install and the updates to that location, and from then on, it's just a matter of hitting publish every time there are new features. In practice, when we start a new project, we set up the installation as soon as there is any code. That way, testers and users can always have access to the latest features. Every time they run the app, they'll get the updates. 
Since testing and user feedback is critical to the success of the project, we want to make this as seamless as possible. In addition, if you build the whole application and then try to create an installation late in the game, you might run into some challenges that would have been easier to solve if you discovered them earlier. For this reason, it's a good idea to build the installation early on and ClickOnce is a great tool for this purpose. I'll start by creating the Azure web app. In my Azure portal, I'll create a resource and select a web app. I don't have a resource group yet, so I'll just create that here. I'm going to name the web app the same thing. I'll select .NET 5 as my runtime stack, although that actually doesn't matter because I won't be running any code through this web app. And then notice I've selected the free tier. This web app serves only one purpose, to deliver my installation files. It doesn't need much in the way of processing power and probably doesn't need much disk space either. So with those options selected, I'm going to review and create and then create. Well, Azure works on deploying that. Let's go set up our installation. This time when we create our new installation, we're going to select click once. As with the other types, we're still going to have to set a published location. In earlier versions, we had the option of publishing directly to an FTP site, which was very handy. I'm not sure why that was removed, but in .NET 5, we have to publish the files locally and then manually FTP them to Azure. So here's where we set our option of our publish location. We're going to publish from website, so we'll need the URL. Let's go see if our web app is ready. And it is, we're all set. So we'll go to that resource, and then we just need to copy the URL to the clipboard. Notice that our URL is in azurewebsites.net. This is fine for testing and development, but for a production installation, you'll want a custom URL. For now, we'll just copy that in here and then move on to settings. The settings tab has a lot of options. The most important things to note are the automatic update and the version. With these options checked, each update will increment the version number and the application will automatically download any new updates it finds. By clicking Update Settings, you can specify whether to check before or after startup, and you can also indicate a minimum version number, which will force the user to update if they want to use the app. The Application Files option will show you a list of the files available and give you the option of including or excluding each file. Prerequisites allows you to include extra runtimes and other tools into your application. This can be very useful. For example, Code Consulting does a lot of work on upgrading Foxboro applications to .NET, and quite often, we'll need our .NET application to read data from a Foxboro table. In these circumstances, we include this OLE provider for Foxboro tables. Also notice the download options. The easiest choice is to just let ClickOnce grab the prerequisites from the vendor website, and this is the default. However, if you have security considerations or bandwidth limitations, you can tell ClickOnce to grab the prerequisites from the installation URL or from a network location. In these cases, you will have to ensure that the prerequisite installation files are placed in the correct location. Publish options gives you a place to set the name of the publisher and the application. There are some other options on the other tabs, such as what to name the HTML file. On the website, this defaults to publish.htmn, htm rather. We'll see this in a minute. Uh, whether we want to create a desktop shortcut to the application, do we need any file associations so that clicking on a file with a specific extension will launch your app, and various other basic options. For now, we're just going to accept the defaults, click Finish, and then we're just going to publish.
Now that our publish, publish is successful, if we go to our Click Once folder, we'll see all of our files. As I mentioned before, we used to be able to automatically FTP these during the publish process, but now we have to do this manually. So I'm going to use FileZilla. But where are we going to send the files? If you go back to Azure, you'll see that your web app has a deployment center. Click on that, and then you go to the FTPS credentials. And that's where you get your FTP location and your username and password. So we'll copy the FTP location, the host rather. Then we'll copy our username and our password. And we, once we connect, you'll see that we basically have an empty FTP site. And now you can see that I've got my ClickOnce uh, published code ready to go. And I can simply upload those files to Azure. At this point, your code is ready to deploy. So if you open that URL, you should see your installation page. But notice that we don't. We don't see anything useful here. This is similar to, to IIS, where you have to go set a default web page. And our default web page, as we saw in the installation process, is publish.htm. So we have to go here to configuration. Default documents, we'll get rid of all the old ones. We'll add publish.htm and save. Once we've successfully updated, now if we go back to the overview and click the URL again, now we have an installation page. It's pretty plain looking, but keep in mind that this is just HTML. So if you want to customize this, you can do that. Now let's go ahead and install it. I'd like to point out that I've disabled some antivirus software. Otherwise, I'd get a lot of warnings about this application because it doesn't have a digital signature. Um, Windows is still going to give me some warnings. In the modern world, that's actually a good thing. We want to be very careful about what gets installed on our computer. But if you want your customers' computers to be able to trust your application, you will need to get some level of a digital certificate. But let's go ahead and try it. So here's one warning. We'll just say keep, keep anyway. And now when we run the app, we'll get one more warning. And now we're doing installation. And once the installation is complete, we've now run our application. So we've installed our Hello World from a website. Now let's take a look at updates. We'll go in and our change our application a little bit. So we've updated our caption. And we're going to publish again. Now, if we look in our folder, we'll see that under application files, we have a second set of files. Uh, so we had 1000, now we have 1001. And these files will now have to be. FTP'd up to Azure. You can either just upload everything and overwrite what's there, or alternately, and this is usually quicker, you can just upload the main files. And then drill into both of these folders 
and just upload the new application files. So now our new version is out there and ready to install. So I'm going to run the Hello World application again. And what happens is you'll see a new version is available. Do I want to upload it now or rather download it now? Sure. And now you'll see I have the new update with our new caption. I do want to show one more option because it has come in handy for me. So we'll add one more little change to our application. Let's just copy this. Maybe we'll make it green, very Christmassy. And one more time, we're going to publish. And our publish has succeeded. So if we refresh here, we'll see that we now have yet another folder, which we will upload. Hop up in both folders to the next level and publish the main files. And now if we go to our website, you'll see here it still says 1.0.0. We'll refresh it. Now it's at 0.2. So if I install again, I will get my warnings. I'll open my file. Last warning. And now I've updated to the latest version again. So those are two different ways of getting your updates. You can either just run the application and let it handle the updates, or you can just keep reinstalling. One thing I do want to mention is that at some point, especially on the free tier, your drive will start to fill up and you'll want to clear out some of these old files. In FileZilla or whatever FTP tool you use, you can simply come in here and delete these older folders. Uh, you do want to make sure to delete the older ones first, um, but you can just delete as much as you need to as long as you have the most recent stuff. It should still work. Another way of doing this directly through Azure is Azure has some cool development tools, and this App Service Editor in Preview actually gives you the ability to go and delete any files you want right through your browser. Obviously, you want to be very careful with this, but if you just right click on any of these, you can just hit delete. So that's click once in a nutshell. If your requirements are simple, click once can be your complete solution for installations. It handles automatic updates and versioning in a simple user friendly manner. And it's easy to host your installations on a website. It has some quirks, but it does the job. Now on to MSIX. MSIX is Microsoft's latest installation tool, and it's a big one. MSIX can be used to install Windows applications, including Win32, WPF, and WinForms. MSIX can only be used on Windows 10, though there are ways around that using the open source SDK. With the SDK, MSIX can even be used cross-platform. Also, if you're planning to release your application on the Microsoft Store, MSIX is the way to go. I'll show a list of resources at the end of this presentation, including a link to the documentation. There's a lot of documentation. I don't know about you, but for me, lots of documentation focused on something I hope will be simple can be a red flag. It's great for figuring out how to do the tricky things but it can sometimes obscure the simple things. Hopefully, as this technology matures, it will also become simpler to use. So let's talk a bit about what Microsoft is hoping to achieve with MSIX. The idea is that MSIX installations will be reliable, performant, and clean. So what do they mean by that? 
Well, for reliability, Microsoft claims a 99.96 success rate over millions of installs. I'd say that's pretty good. Network optimization is achieved by only downloading 64K blocks. There's an XML file that keeps a list of the files included in the application, as well as indexes and hashes for each 64K block. This allows the blocks that make up the files to be downloaded incrementally, and also allows updates to only pull the blocks that have changed, as opposed to pulling down all the files for each update. Minor updates can be almost instantaneous and are much faster than click once. MSIX optimizes your disk space by managing shared files across applications, so there's no duplication of files. Applications are still independent of one another, so you don't have to worry about updates to one application negatively impacting another application. And also, using MSIX guarantees a complete uninstall. What this means is that while other installation technologies may leave some artifacts behind on uninstall, MSIX is guaranteed to completely remove any trace of the application. An important feature of MSIX is that applications packaged with MSIX are run in lightweight containers. The application will write to its own virtual registry and its own virtual data folder, both of which will be deleted on uninstall. Other applications will not have access to the virtual registry or the data folder. This process is handled differently depending on which version of Windows 10 you are running, but overall it should be seamless. And also, all MSIX applications have access to the global registry. As Windows 10 and MSIX have evolved, new features have become available. I found this table and a few others in the documentation. I think it's important to understand at this stage, some features of MSIX are not available in all versions of Windows 10. If you're trying to build an installation and something you need isn't there, you might want to check the documentation specific to your Windows 10 version or even just upgrade to the latest. Now let's go ahead and build an installation for a desktop application. This will require adding a new packaging project to the Visual Studio solution. That's a requirement that may go away in the future. Also, you'll see that much of the tooling is Microsoft Store specific. We'll be side loading, which is really just a fancy way of saying not loading from the Microsoft Store. Generally, this is how line of business applications are installed. So I'm going to show you how to publish the installation to Azure just like we did with Click Once. We'll publish the original app and then we'll make a change and we'll publish the update. Just like with Click Once, I've created an Azure web app pretty much just looks exactly like the other one with one difference. Let me show you in FileZilla. So if you look in the folder, I've added this web.config file. This file is very important and it took some digging to find it. Here's what it looks like. As the comment states, without this file, the website won't serve up the file types needed by the installation. So you have to make sure to create this file and put it in the root directory so that uh, when you go looking for these files on your installation page, it actually will serve them up. Now that we've got an installation location, let's go back to Visual Studio and we'll add our installation project. So you can just come into this search window and search for MSIX. It'll take a second and find a Windows application packaging project. Then you just hit next. We'll just call it MSIX demo install and create it. So here you'll see we're given a couple of options. You can actually pick a target version and a minimum version of Windows 10. And this goes back to the table I showed you on a slide. Uh, basically what we want to make sure is that whatever features we need are available in the version of Windows 10 that we're selecting. For our case, we're just going to accept the defaults. And now we're given a page that actually has a bunch of links to functionality and documentation. But the first step is for us to add our application to our installation. And we do that by right clicking here on the applications node. Notice that we actually can add both of these applications. You can create an installation package that will install more than one tool at a time. But we'll just choose 
this one WPF app. And now we're going to choose Edit Your Package in a Designer. As you can see, this designer has a lot of options in six different tabs. Almost all of these options are Microsoft Store specific, so we're going to keep it simple and head straight to Packaging. And even here, we're going to accept mostly the defaults, but I'm going to go ahead and select a certificate, just a test certificate that I've created. MSIX is much stricter about certificates, and also it makes the installation process much easier. Uh, as you'll recall from our Click Once installation, there were a lot of hoops we had to jump through to make sure that our operating system would accept the application. Assigning a certificate will get us through that. It'll only work on my machine, but in uh, production, you would actually have to get a real digital certificate. And now we're all set to publish. So we'll just right click on the packaging project. Notice that that is where we'll be publishing from. We won't be publishing the actual application. We'll come down here to publish and we'll select create app packages. As I mentioned, we're going to be sideloading. I've already assigned my certificate, and you can see that here. Here we can see this is where our output location is. We're, we could change that if we wanted to. Um, I've chosen x86 as a target. Version number starts at 1, and we're going to say automatically increment. And you'll see that when we publish an update. And then next, we have to let it know where the installer is. So that's on our web page. We just come over here and copy the URL and paste it in here and hit Create. And you'll see it'll build all of our applications and then begin packaging them up. When the publish is complete, you'll be presented with this dialog. It'll show your output location here as a link so you can just click on it and go look at your files. These files are not that different from what we saw in Click Once. We've got an HTML file, a little installer file, and a folder that contains the majority of the files. I think it's nice that the MSIX Packager uses an index.html because it saves us the step of going in and setting that as our default document on our web page because index.html is already one of the default documents. But as with Click once, we do need to FTP our files up to the website. So we'll do just grab all these and upload them. And now that our files are up on Azure, we can open our web page. And then we just have to click on the install button. And here we go. We get this little dialog, click on install. Wait a minute or two while it downloads. It's a small app, so it should go fairly quickly. And here we are. So now we've got a basic installation for a really simple WPF application. But now let's go ahead and make a change to that application and publish that change. Not a major change, but we want to get this change to our users. So here again, we're just going to go to Publish and Create App Packages. Just walk through these same options. Notice that our version number has incremented to 1010 and Create. 
and we're presented with our dialog again. You'll see the version is upgraded. And if we hop back to that folder, we now see, again, similar to click once, we've got another folder here. So we'll go back to FileZilla, refresh, upload everything that needs uploading. Let's go ahead and overwrite. And now that our new files are up there, I just wanted to point out that, again, we've inc incremented our version here, but we don't have to install from here. All we have to do is go to our link here from the previous installation. And we'll see that we've got the new installation. I will say that it does sometimes take a couple of seconds for that installation to be available, but you will notice that it does happen pretty quickly. So that is, in a sense, the click once version of MSIX. Uh, basically, you've got a ton of options. There's lots and lots of documentation to help you figure out those options. But if you really want to just create a simple installation that will update itself and be hosted on a web page, you can do that fairly easily. Um, if you don't need all of those other options, hopefully this demonstration showed you how to sidestep them and just do the things that you need to do. So in closing, let's talk about our options. You've got a desktop application you need to deploy to your customer base. Which method should you choose? If you just need to get your application to a specific target as quickly as possible, you could certainly choose a self-contained deployment or even single file then you just have to get the files to the target and they'll run. If you need the application to run on multiple platforms, you can use a framework dependent deployment. This does mean that the target machines must have the appropriate framework installed in order for the application to run. If you need a more fully featured installation with automatic updates, and especially if your customer base still has older machines, click once is a nice option. It's been around a while, it's still being maintained, and it's not going anywhere anytime soon. All of the installations I've built for the past few years have been click once, and I don't see any need to change them to MSIX. Do you need more complex options? Is speed and efficiency a concern? Are you interested in deploying to the Microsoft Store? Is your customer base all at least on Windows 10? In these cases, you probably want to look into MSIX. Moving forward for new customers, if I can count on them having newer machines with Windows 10 on them, I'll probably use MSIX, especially now that I've gone through it and learned how to build installations that just work. I'd like to thank everyone for joining today. I learned a lot while creating this presentation and I hope I've passed some of it on. Here's a list of resources I used and I highly recommend going through some of these yourself, especially the Microsoft documentation on MSIX. There's a lot more to it. And with that said, I'll see you all at the next state of .NET. Great job, Jeff. Well, that just about wraps up this webinar. Don't forget to fill out the event survey to be eligible for the $100 Amazon gift card. Make sure you complete the survey by Friday at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time. Schedule your hour of code and get free help from our team of expert developers. Our Code Magazine mobile app is available on Android and iOS phones. Our next State of .NET webinar is Wednesday, June 30th at 1 p.m. Eastern, and it will cover .NET 5 and a .NET 6 preview. You're not going to want to miss it. And that's a wrap. Jeff, myself, and the members of the Code family hope you found this helpful and are excited about deploying your application on Windows. Members of the Code team will stick around in the chat window answering any questions you may have. Thanks again for joining us today.